The colossal misunderstanding about time is the assumption that insight will work with people who are unmotivated to change. Communication does not depend on syntax or eloquence or rhetoric or articulation, but on the emotional context in which the message is being heard. People can only hear you when they are moving towards you, and they are not likely to when your words are pursuing them. Even the choicest of words lose their power when they are used to overpower. Attitudes are the real figures of speech. And this week's opening quote comes from Edwin H. Freeman. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Well, folks, interesting times in the world today. As I've been saying recently, we are quite literally walking on a knife edge at the moment. I have been pointing this out to you for quite a while. And I have been saying that 2015 is going to be a year to look out for because they're going to be rolling a lot of stuff out in 2015 and we've seen that they are doing precisely that. And if the truth be told, folks, it would appear that the end game has now begun in earnest. Much of what is happening in the United States seems to be in preparation for something that is right around the corner. And we've been expecting this for a long time. It's just that... Most people have been viewing all of the information that we've been bringing to the world, myself and other researchers and radio hosts have been bringing to the world, most people have been viewing it as simply some type of spy novel and the very interesting and fascinating secret story about the hidden mechanism and the hidden hand and the terrible psychopathic global elite and their nefarious plans. It's like some sort of a movie that people believe they're watching or something they haven't seemed to have realized that they are actually participating in this movie and that we have had every opportunity to rewrite the script ourselves if we would only choose to participate, stand up, be counted, and get involved in the global situation. The problem, of course, has been that people have been trained to believe that they are simply little people who can't affect change and They've been kind of trained to leave the workings of the system to the bigger people at the top who know what's going on, leave things in their hands, and they will work stuff out for you. But the reality is, folks, that there is a war going on, and it's been going on for a very long time. As I mentioned in my very first film, The Big Picture, in 2008, World War III has already started, and what World War III is, is a war that is being waged against the common people of the world by the global elite, those who control the financial systems and who control our governments, they have been carrying out a slow genocide against the people of all the countries of this earth for quite some time now. They're doing it not only with the wars that they're conducting in the Middle East and places like Ukraine, but there is a soft kill operation going on in all countries through food additives, fluoride, aerial spraying and vaccination programs. And because people are beginning to wake up to the control grid, now they are locking the control grid down and they're doing it in a very, very efficient way. And it fascinates me that people are simply standing by and watching all this happen around them and they're constantly commenting on it, but nobody is really doing anything about it. Nobody's really rallying their communities. Nobody seems to be asking the right questions to the politicians Nobody appears to be taking any type of positive action to circumvent the actions of these people. And that's a very concerning situation because they are really rolling things out this year, folks. And you've just got to look at the global situation and start connecting the dots. And the future that these people are attempting to create becomes very, very apparent. And I'd like to connect a few of those dots for you today, actually. And I don't want to be fear-mongering with any of this, but 
I think it's important to pay attention to some of the key issues that are happening around us in our communities at the moment. And when looking at these issues, not to just view them as local issues, but to put them on a global stage and see where they fit in with everything else. And we know what the plans of these people are. We've been talking about it for years. So let's just step back and look at what's unfolding before us, shall we? And folks, when looking at these issues, it's important to understand the mentality of these people, to understand the mentality of the global elite, and to look at what your motivations are and what you do in addressing the situation as well. I mean, I can't stress this enough. It's important to understand who we're dealing with, and it's very important for people to maintain their focus on their own inner state, you know, the the motivation in their actions, you know, what their intentions are in what they're doing, why they are speaking out against this system. And look, in looking at the global elite, a lot of people have said to me, look, you've just got to send love to these people and we need to heal these people and and help them see the world from a more humane or human perspective. And sure, look, I can understand that mentality. I can understand that line of thought and When I talk about these people and I speak out against these people, I don't do it out of hatred for them. I love them the way I love all living creatures, but I'm not going to bother trying to send these people positive energy because they're simply not susceptible to it, and I'm never going to change their mind. I'm never going to change their way of thinking because I can understand what they are and who they are. And like I said, folks, I don't do anything I do out of hatred. I do it because of my positive intention for the future of mankind. I do what I do out of love for all mankind and my disgust at the actions of these people. Well, not even disgust. I don't know if that's even the right word. Really, it's my absolute horror at what I see being perpetrated against the innocent souls on this planet. That's why I do what I do. I do what I do because I can see a better future if mankind would simply step back and take stock of themselves a little bit. But I view these people as what they are, folks, and so I can understand why people would would say, well, perhaps we just have to send loving energy to these people. But you've got to understand these people are psychopaths, folks. They don't have any empathy. And because you're dealing with people who have no empathy, it's very difficult to even judge what these people are doing as evil. It's what we perceive evil to be. But really, it's simply psychopathy. And yes, yeah, sure, it's it's kind of evil what they're doing. It is evil actions, but they do so because they have no empathy. They don't view people as being part of the equation. If vast numbers of people die, it doesn't matter. It's just collateral damage to them. It's the way we would view a colony of ants or a herd of cattle or a flock of sheep. I mean, as a society, you know, ants mean nothing to us. And as for sheep and cattle, well, we breed these creatures and we harvest them and we eat them and we do so generally with no remorse. And sure, it's cruelty to do this from a realistic perspective, but from a social perspective, we do it unconsciously. We don't think about it. We don't view it as cruel. It's just an unconscious psychopathic action that people carry out completely without thought. And this is generally because we just don't have empathy for the animals that we're killing and harvesting and eating. We don't have empathy for them because we're trained to believe that these are just dumb animals. They're not of any consequence. They don't think the way we do. They have no memory and emotion the way we do. And so they're a lower species and they're just there for us. And people have been generally trained to believe this, whether it's true or not. We believe that because we have the power of speech, it makes us better than everything else. It doesn't make us better. It makes us exceptional because we are able to communicate things on a far more complex level than many animals are. And so as a species, we have generally been removed of any empathy for the animals, which is what allows us to do what we do to them. And this is all due to the training that we've had, the shutdown of our right brain. I mean, I could get into all sorts of esoteric reasons as to why this has occurred, but the fact is that this is generally how we are as a society in the way we view the animal kingdom. And all of this is based on a lack of empathy, and that empathy has been removed from us due to the training that we've had. And it's the same for the elite. They would have no thought or concern for the hardship that they cause other people. It's not part of the equation to them. It's all about managing the system and creating a totally left-brain structured reality that is mathematically and systemically perfect. They want a system that functions in a certain way because they value order. And people don't really come into the equation in this respect. 
And sure, there are psychopaths who operate within the highest levels of this system, and psychopaths do what psychopaths do. But at all of the other levels and all the tiers within the system, all of the people who operate within these tiers are trained to think this way. They're trained to view people as simply numbers on screens and collateral damage when they get hurt. Simply because these people have been trained at certain universities like Yale and Oxford and certain universities that are set up around the planet simply to educate these people in this manner of thinking. And so people very comfortably operate within the parameters of the psychopathic system, not because they are evil, but simply because they've been trained to think without empathy, at least in regard to any aspects of the business world. People may have empathy for their family members and for people that they know. They may love their dog, but when they go to the office and they start operating within that business structure, all empathy is removed from the equation and people simply become numbers on a screen. And it isn't about the people. It's about balancing the books and making the system more efficient because this is the way they've been trained to think and it's the way they've been trained to operate. And they simply know no other way of functioning within the business world. So it's important to understand this, folks. If you really want to do something about the system and combat the system and create a better future and work for something positive, you need to understand how the system works. And it's also important to understand that there have been many traps laid for us in regard to how we should address this situation. I mean, when we protest against this system, when we attempt to take action against it, very often we seek to do so from the wrong perspective in as much as we follow parameters that have been placed there for us to follow. We have protests, we have marches, we shake our fist at the system, we have people who stand up and talk and sprout violent rhetoric. But nothing really happens from all of these events. At the end of them, we all go home and the system remains where it is and it lulls us into this state of fear inside for many people where they sit at home carrying and they wait for something to happen. They start gathering ammo and guns and wait for the crunch to come down. But violent revolution will not achieve anything. It's not really the right approach to have. Because in violent revolution, who are you really directing your violence at? Who are you directing your anger at? Violent revolution breeds hatred. If the National Guard and the people who are out there performing the actions of the NSA are met with violence then it creates anger and that leads to hatred. And you're fighting innocent people who are simply doing what they're doing because they've been trained to do so. And they're fighting you because you're fighting back. And so this cycle happens and we don't really get anywhere. And with all of this, I'm not saying don't defend yourself if people come to get you. I mean, hopefully it won't come to that. But if it does, well, yeah, you should defend yourself. Absolutely. But I think we still have the means to circumvent that if we approach it in the right way. And that's why I tried to offer you that perspective earlier that I've just offered you of how the system is actually structured and how people operate within it. Because when you look at it that way, then who do you direct your anger at? Who Who is there to be angry with? Really, it's the system itself that is the problem. But there are mechanisms within the system that we can use to redress this situation now and circumvent the place we're heading to if we apply the right perspective to it. And if we approach it with the right intention, with an intention to heal this situation, and I think we do still have every opportunity to heal the situation if we can somehow find a way of uniting our community, because there are legal mechanisms in place within their fiction that we can use against them if we choose to stand up and call things what they are. And because many of the people who function within the system are simply doing what they're trying to do, many of the people at the different tiers within the hierarchy Many of these people are not psychopaths. They're just operating within psychopathic parameters because they've been trained to operate from that perspective. The system is a psychopathic system. And when you work within that system, you're trained to view efficiency as success. And all efficiency does is consolidate the power of the system. And many people who work within this and who work to make the system more efficient do so simply because of their training, not because they're psychopaths. And I believe if these people are approached by an empowered community who stands up and speaks the truth eloquently and simply and plainly enough, then things will change. But even in saying that, it's important to understand that it needs to also be presented in the right manner. 
much the way I alluded to in the opening quote. You've got to have the correct emotional content there as well, folks. That's why anger is so ineffective in dealing with this. Anger and violence and screaming out rhetoric is so ineffective in dealing with this situation. You've got to remain calm and simply speak truthfully and call things for what they are. And that is the solution, and it's the solution because it is so effective that if the community stood up and did this, it's not really... An educational comedy. It's not a cause, not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. A genuine expression. A certain Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, two egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, zany, politically incorrect, your common gilded style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be you to the fullest. simply because of their training, not because they're psychopaths. And I believe if these people are approached by an empowered community who stands up and speaks the truth eloquently and simply and plainly enough, then things will change. But even in saying that, it's important to understand that it needs to also be presented in the right manner. Much the way I alluded to in the opening quote, you've got to have the correct emotional content there as well, folks. That's why anger is so ineffective in dealing with this. Anger and violence and screaming out rhetoric is so ineffective in dealing with this situation. You've got to remain calm and simply speak truthfully and call things for what they are. And that is the solution, and it's the solution because it is so effective that if the community stood up and did this, it's not really arguable. We're not creating violence, we're not creating confrontation, we're simply standing up and saying things in the way they need to be said, and we're not pulling any punches, we're just calling a spade a spade and saying things for what they are. Hey, if we're wrong, show us. But by your actions, it would appear that all of you in government are all in abusive office, and you've been playing us like a fiddle, and we've pretty well had enough, and we want to create some healing for this human condition, and that's what we're doing. Now, we still have the means to do that, folks, and that may sound all esoteric and airy-fairy and like it would never work, but really, if you can look within your heart, you'll see that it will. And really, that's the only way to avoid violent confrontation. And I think we've been given an opportunity to do that, and the problem with violent revolution is that it circumvents that. You know, even though it may get to the point where people are required to defend themselves with whatever they have to do so, I think we can still circumvent things from getting to that point by addressing things from the correct perspective, because ultimately there are very, very few people at the top who are pulling the strings on all this. And it's important as well when looking at the situation, looking at what's going on at the top, a lot of people are saying, well, this is China and the West playing things off against each other, it's Islam playing itself off against Israel. At the top, folks, there is no left and right. There is no good and bad. At the top is the financial system which puppeteers the whole thing. And... These people do what they do to consolidate power, and they don't care which power system it is that works. They don't care if America runs the world or England runs the world or China or Russia or North Korea. They couldn't care who runs the world as long as the people who are running the world are being run by them. That's what it's all about. So get the whole concept of this left and right paradigm, even in regard to countries, and get this out of your mind because that's not what it's about. What it's about is consolidating the control grid and discarding those sections of humanity that they don't need anymore. They don't need the West anymore. They don't need the Western capitalist system to remain in place. The Western capitalist system has functioned just fine in creating massive global instability and consolidating the power of the elite. It's done so while the people of Western culture have been distracted with toys and trinkets and television and this false reality they've been trained to believe in. And by convincing these people that everything outside of that reality, everything that isn't like Western culture, is a threat to Western culture. 
And this training and programming has allowed the West to go out and decimate all of these other countries. But now they've got control of the place. Now they're putting their financial system everywhere. They're balkanizing all the Middle East. They're consolidating their power. They're setting up all the dominoes for greater Israel. And they've used Western society to do it. And now they don't need Western society anymore. So it's easy to just discard these people because, hey, we don't need them. They were stupid enough to go along with it anyway. So obviously they're just like the cattle and the sheep, and they have no empathy for these people. And that's the problem that we face, folks. But as I said, there are many people who work within the system who do have empathy, who have just been trained to work within psychopathic parameters because they simply don't know what they're doing. They really seriously know not what they do. And so it's very difficult to hate these people. And I really believe that violent revolution and violence towards anybody ultimately comes from fear and only breeds hatred it causes the opponents to hate each other and this is not healthy and it doesn't achieve anything and i don't think it's any way out and i think if we simply stand up and speak the truth and call a spade a spade now we're going to find that there are many people who work within the parameters of the system that are going to agree with us and i think we could stand up and hold the criminals that are running this system accountable for their actions and put some transparency back into these systems and lead humanity to a very good place from this point. In fact, I think we've been given every opportunity to do so. I really do. You know, as I keep saying, we are quite literally walking a knife edge at the moment, and we have the potential to make this one of the greatest times in human history. It is certainly one of the most important and most significant times in human history already. But we have an opportunity here to make it one of the greatest times in human history, the time when humanity chose freedom and created some real abundance and some real truth in the human situation and we have another choice and that is to ignore this opportunity in which case the prison doors will come slamming shut and reality from that point will be a very different one to the one we have the opportunity of now creating and we have all the means to do it folks we have the people we have the manpower we have the knowledge all we need is the intention and the motivation And really, folks, when you step back and look at things realistically, I think that that is all the motivation that you need for positive action. You just have to choose to do it. Now, something that I was touching on before was the fact that violent revolution breeds hatred. And there are many aspects of the system that are also designed to breed hatred in people. You see, when you have a person that is working within psychopathic parameters, they are forced to behave in a sociopathic manner and discard people along the way because that's the way the system works. And you attempt to combat some type of bureaucracy and you find the person behind the counter or on the other end of the telephone or behind the desk sitting there saying, well, look, I'd like to help you, but my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do because it says here that these are the rules. And again, she's adhering to a paper-based reality. And you're there left in a state of frustration. There's this kind of emptiness in the soul that's generated because you're left in a state of anger and frustration because there's no one to actually direct your anger at. And this turns into hatred for the person behind the counter or hatred for the system. And it's designed in this way. It's designed specifically to arouse these emotions in people hatred, anger, frustration and powerlessness to do anything against the bureaucracy because you're fighting a cloud. And that's the thing, folks. It's fiction. You're fighting something that is fiction. It doesn't exist, so you have nothing to direct your anger at. You're fighting a reality that's been created by words that have been written on a piece of paper, but it's not actually reality. It's just an idea that was written down on a piece of paper. And these sort of situations also create kind of a feedback loop in people. You know, if you are faced with bureaucracy, then you start getting angry with the person behind the counter. They sit there and they cross their arms and they start to feed off your anger. And the more angry you get, the more stubborn they get. So you get this incredibly negative emotional feedback loop happening between the two people. And all this is done by design, folks. 
And when you look at this, it's like the situation I was explaining before. When you're fighting with the National Guardsmen, you both begin hating each other simply because you're battling each other. It's the same when you're battling with someone behind the counter. You get this feedback loop happening and you both start to dislike each other. And the encounter starts turning into something hateful when it's just two people who don't actually really know each other who are both in a position where they're adhering to a fictional reality that's been created by somebody else and just dropped into their laps. And it might be a little bit difficult for you to look at things that way to begin with, but really when you step back and look at it, that's exactly what it is. It's fiction, and not only that, it's someone else's fiction that's been superimposed over our reality. I mean, we didn't think of any of this stuff up, and we didn't plan to do any of this. It's just the way things are, because we were told and trained to believe that this is the way things are. And we get faced with these situations and we get enormously frustrated with the person behind the counter. We start petitioning, we start writing letters and we start trying to address the symptom rather than looking at the problem, which is systemic corruption. The whole thing is corrupt. The whole thing is designed to be corrupt. It's designed to create this feeling of powerlessness in people and thereby to corrupt them by corrupting their train of thought, by corrupting their energetic state by sending them down a blind alley of hatred, frustration and powerlessness rather than allowing them the time to simply step back and ask the question, why? Why am I constrained by this fictional reality? Because the truth is, folks, that if enough people were to step back and simply ask this question, then you'd find the fictional paper-based reality would fail. And the thing is that many people are beginning to ask this question because the slavery system is becoming apparent to people. And that's what it is, folks. It's a slavery system. And this is what all of our governments are running. And, and what they are harvesting from this slavery system is the energy of all of the people who operate within it. It's not about wealth, folks. It's about control. And that's what this system is. And because it's exposing itself so much, it's giving us the opportunity to heal it. And that's why the powers that believe they be are ramping this control grid up and militarizing the police and doing everything they can to maintain control because they know that the game is up. People are beginning to realize what's going on here. But the problem is that we are heading for some very precarious times globally and unfortunately, people are looking at the situation locally. They're not really looking at it globally. And people are attempting to address local problems without connecting them to the global problems and realizing that it's all connected. But we are heading for a very precarious global situation financially, simply because of the current economic climate on the planet. And things could go very pear-shaped very soon, which could prove very detrimental for everybody. But I believe that if we approach things in the correct manner before that point, then we can address things still before they get too bad. And we can do it simply by exposing the fish to people and standing up and calling things out for what they are. But the key point in all of it, folks, is for people to get it into their heads that it's fiction. This whole financial system, all the global debt, all the concept that countries owe other countries money and all this sort of stuff, it's all fiction, folks. It's all designed to consolidate control on the planet and discard those sections of humanity that do not serve the system. That's what it's all about, and it's got nothing to do with actual reality at all. But the thing is, in even saying that, look, they're doing this because they're scared that people are waking up, there's also other reasons that they're doing it, folks, because, as I said, we are heading for some pretty precarious economic situations. And I find also there's too much talk in the alternative media of confirming for people that we're on the right track and we're winning and that they're doing all this simply because they're scared of us. Because there is a wider perspective to take on all of this as well, folks. I mean, sure, they are no doubt concerned at the global awakening that's happening and the level of consciousness on the planet, but I don't really think they're scared of it that much because they know a little bit more about what's going on. And there are, in fact, other reasons why our police are being militarised and why things are turning as pear-shaped as they are. And I'll try to connect a few dots for you after the break, folks. Like I said, I don't want to be seen as fear-mongering on any of this, but there are certain things that are happening around the planet and around our various countries that I think we need to be concerned about and I think we need to pay attention to and 
prepare for any possible scenarios that may be unfolding soon. But we'll discuss that after the break, folks, because it is break time now, so we're going to have a break. Thank you for listening to the show today. It's always a pleasure to have your company, and I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so why did I bring you all of that perspective that I brought you on the first half of the show? Well, I did it because I think it's important to understand how the system works and to understand how people get their mindsets within the system, why it's always so confrontational when trying to deal with it. Because I think it's important to look at things from this perspective in order to find real remedy to the situation that we find ourselves in. I mean, ultimately, it's all about energy exchanges, folks. It really is. And that may sound hippie-like or esoteric or whatever, but it isn't. It's true. It's in the delivery of the message that you have. You know, if you're trying to combat this system and you get angry with it and you lapse into hatred, then you're coming from a bad center and you're never going to achieve anything because you're coming from a state of imbalance. You've got to look at things from a balanced perspective and speak out about them from a balanced perspective. And you've got to be honest in what you say. And don't worry about political correctness. Don't worry about skirting the issues. Simply speak directly and address the root cause of the problem and go straight to its heart. That's what you really need to do. And if it's done from a calm and logical perspective, there's very little the system can do to combat it, especially if there are large numbers of people that are all coming from this perspective and coming from this calm center And look, earlier on in the broadcast, I was saying that you can't do this from a center of anger. And that's true in many ways. But you've got to put this into perspective. And look, I'm not saying don't get angry, folks. I think you should get angry. It's just what you do with that anger. I mean, I'm angry. I'm incredibly angry. You think I'm not angry? I am. I'm absolutely irate. And that is why I do the shows and do the things that I do and do the lectures and make the films, because I'm angry at what is being done to this planet. But I channel that anger into calm, rational response. And I believe it's effective. It's an effective response. If I channeled that anger into hatred and started shaking my fist and screaming out and punching walls and blowing things up, well, it's a negative response. It's not achieving anything. All it's doing is feeding back into the negativity. And it's not addressing things from the root cause of the problem. You know, the problem has been created through an imbalance in the human condition. As I mentioned in my film, The Awakening, that I made in 2009, what evil really is, is an imbalance due to people acting in contradiction to the one law. And the one law of creation is unconditional love and service to creation. And that's the way I approach things when dealing with my anger. I channel my anger into the calm demeanor of the radio shows. But I do these shows because I'm angry, folks. It's important to understand that. But anger doesn't have to turn into violence. Anger can be used to calmly approach a situation in a rational way, and in doing so, it becomes very empowering for onlookers. It becomes very empowering for other people to see that this is the way anger can be channeled, into something calm, and something calm that is driven by anger, and that anger is driven by love. This is a very, very powerful force, folks, and if we use this and approach the situation in this way, we can make a difference simply by being calm and rational in what we do. I mean, we really could bring about momentous changes if we approach things from this manner, folks. We really could. But we need the strength of numbers, of course. You can't do this on your own. You know, you don't want to be standing up against this system on your own, claiming your sovereignty and all this sort of stuff in the court. If there's no one there looking at you and there's no one there to record what's happening, I mean, they've got secret prisons they're just disappearing people into who stand up against them. So... It has to be done in mass, folks. And we need to look at the very many opportunities we're being given to actually stand up and address this situation, folks, because we are. I mean, as I've said so many times in the past and so many times on the shows recently, what our governments are doing is abuse of office. And there can be no security for the nation if the governments that control the infrastructure of those nations are removed of accountability and if the people are paying the price for their actions. In such a situation, the nation is not secure and the government has abused its office and we need to address it. And 
Sure, they are concerned that people are speaking out about this sort of stuff, but they're not quite as scared of us as people are pretending and people are suggesting. I mean, very often in the alternate media, there's a certain amount of hubris in the way it's presented when they say, oh, look, they're doing all this because they're scared of us because we're winning. You know, it's just presented with a, a certain amount of overconfidence, which helps people to just sit back and ignore the situation and think, oh, well, we're all safe because they're scared of us. So there's a certain amount of programming that goes with that statement, folks. And yeah, they are concerned of what's going on, but but don't approach the situation from a state of hubris. You need to be concerned as well. Now, there really are a lot of interesting things going on at the moment. And we seem to be heading for a particularly interesting economic situation, as I mentioned earlier, folks. Because when you do start connecting the dots... And you start looking at what's actually been going on in Yemen with the invasion in Yemen. You start looking at Operation Jade Helm that's going right out across many of the southern states of the United States. And you look at the closing down of the Walmarts that's happened in the United States as well, which is unprecedented for these Walmarts to be closed down. And Walmarts never close. And they're stipulating plumbing concerns for all of these Walmarts, and yet... They're stipulating the same reason for every single one they're closing down, and this is right across the country. And no plumbers have been seen going into the building, so obviously there's something else going on there, so you need to look a little bit deeper at Walmarts and their possible uses. And for this, all we have to do is turn to Yemen and look what's just happened in Yemen, because the U.S. Special Forces in Yemen, when they arrived, what they did was they commandeered the Walmarts and turned them into military posts because Walmarts are designed to be able to do this with. Essentially, every town in the United States that has a Walmart store has a military post in that town, because that's what the Walmart store can be very easily converted into. And we've just seen them do this in Yemen. And it appears almost to have been a practice run. And when you combine that practice run with the practice run that is Operation Jade Helm, what they're doing in Jade Helm is they're practicing rounding up civilians and taking them to centres and then reintegrating them. So if they're reintegrating people, it would appear that they're practicing taking people somewhere and doing something to them and then reintegrating them back into some other environment or back into the same environment after they've been somehow changed in some way. That's what it would suggest anyway. That's what reintegration suggests. And Operation Jade Helm is essentially an extraction and reintegration program. Extraction, this would mean that possibly they're not talking about taking whole communities, perhaps simply gun owners or people of particular interest in communities. I imagine these extractions will be done at like 3 or 4am the way it usually is. And so that appears to be what Jade Helm is all about. And very interestingly, Operation Jade Helm is running until mid-September. And right alongside this, we see the Walmart stores closing down for plumbing reasons, we're told, and we're told that this will take about six months as well, which leads us to mid-September. Now, I mentioned a few shows ago that this is a Shemitah year and that the end of Shemitah falls in September this year. And I said to watch out because we often see major changes happen in Shemitah years near the end of Shemitah. And something else that's happening this year, possibly, is that China may be foreclosing on its loan to the United States and suggesting the possibility that it may be time for China to take over the global reserve currency because the United States dollar really does not have any value left. And if China does float a new currency, and look, when I say float a new currency or become the global reserve currency or foreclose a state, I mean, I'm not a financial person. I don't really know what the right terminology is for whatever this manoeuvre China is going to pull, but I know China is expected to do something reasonably substantial on the global monetary stage in September, specifically on September the 10th. Now, I've got this information from people who work within the banking community, and apparently the banking community is all talking about what China may do on September 10th, and if it does bring in its new currency or, or take over the reserve currency or whatever it's got planned to do, the result will be the crash of the entire Western capitalist system. And it's quite possible that this could happen on September 10th. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just simply looking at all these connections and putting them all together. 
I've been looking at Jade Helm and looking with these Walmart closures and looking at the date of September, and then just right out of the blue, I get told by a banking insider that September 10th is a very significant day for the world because China may well be rendering the U.S. dollar completely and utterly useless on that day, which would mean people would be waking up to a completely new economic reality on September the 11th of this year. And while this happens, Jade Helm will still be in place. So if they do need to suddenly switch from drill mode to real mode and start rounding people up because of food shortages or riots or whatever, then all of the pieces are in place for them to do it. And with the Walmarts closed, all of these military posts are also set up to take care of this if it should happen. And when I look at Yemen and I see that they've just run the whole U.S. Special Forces operation via the Walmarts in Yemen, which they converted to C2 command centers, then I have to ask if this is what they are preparing for with Operation Jade Helm and the closing of the Walmarts. I mean, even the name Jade Helm. Jade, of course, relates to China. One must wonder whether this has anything to do with China possibly foreclosing on the United States debt. Because the United States' debt to China far exceeds the net worth of the country and everything in it. Now, you look at all this and you think, well, okay, if they did start doing this and Jade Helm suddenly turned from drill to live, well, there'd be the patriots and they'd coordinate themselves and there'd be a response. But you've got to wonder how this response would come about because... Now that they have rolled out the digital network as well, and they've managed to put towers everywhere. You notice the amount of microwave towers there are everywhere now, folks. And, I mean, we had fine signal before they put all these towers in. There wasn't any real need for them to put towers in all these places that they put them. Or was there? Because you've really got to look at how the digital network functions and how it can be controlled. By way of example, there's a town not too far from me, about 60 miles away, and it's a hippie town called Nimbin. A lot of pot smokers, there's sort of weed signs all over the place, and the town gets quite regularly raided by squads of police that come up from Sydney. The local police don't really worry about it too much, but lately there's been squads coming up from Sydney and they've been raiding the town. And when they raid the town and the farms in the area, what they do is they shut down the digital network in the area so that there is no communication out of the area. And there's also, of course, no communication within the area, so people within the area cannot ring each other to alert their friends to the fact that the police are raiding the town. So they can shut down digital networks, folks, and not the whole network, mind you, just pockets of the network. I imagine they can triangulate with towers so they can shut down a certain pocket of a network and not the whole network. So everybody else is still using their phones. They don't know that there's anything going on in this one little area because no signal is getting in or out of that particular pocket within the network. So if they were to go live with Operation Jade Helm in America and simply shut down the digital networks in the respective areas where they were concentrating on at the time, then there's no way for anybody to let anybody know. There's no way for you to even contact a guy down the road and let him know that there's something fishy going on, the military are knocking on your door, because you'll find your internet system and your digital network system will not function. And so there's no way to get a signal out to people. This is one of the reasons I believe they have replaced the analog network with a digital network, because they were not able to shut the analog network down as easily and quickly and effectively and selectively as they can the digital network. And they can do this, I believe, by simply accessing each area through the many towers that they've got placed around all of our countries now. So you can see they've actually been constructing the whole dominoes for the end game right around us as we've been going about our daily lives. And they've even been running test cases right under our nose and practice runs right under our nose and quite frankly, folks, it amazes me that people can just look at all of this going on around them and think nothing of it. And again, look, by saying all of this, I'm not saying that they're going to do this, and this is what's going to happen in September. I just find it very interesting that all of the pieces now appear to be in place. All the dominoes appear to be set up, and 
the fact that they've closed the Walmarts in the United States, this is a very, very strange thing, folks. This is something that they wouldn't normally do if they were not preparing to go live with this whole scenario. So I just have to look at it and wonder. And like I said, I'm not trying to be fear-mongering with any of this, but looking at this and seeing all of these dominoes now in place, I just feel it would be irresponsible of me not to bring it to the attention of the listeners. And as I said, folks, I'm not saying it's all going to happen. I'm not saying it's all going to go live. I'm just suggesting that people pay attention and perhaps prepare for any scenario to happen in September this year. Of course, it would be hard to tell people about this because there's been so many people crying wolf for the last seven years. Oh, FEMA camps, oh, rolling out the police state, all the stuff they're talking about doing. Oh, the financial crash. Everyone's been waiting for the financial crash for the last five years, but it hasn't come yet. So now if you tell people it might be just around the corner, they really don't believe you because people have been crying wolf for so long. It's the same with the FEMA camps. And yes, folks, they are going to do it. The FEMA camps do exist. This isn't a debatable point. They are there, and they are going to be used for something one day. And we are all expecting a financial crash. We're all expecting some big scenario to happen. And when you look at what's going on in 2015 and the way all the pieces are now in place, I just think it would be prudent for people to be prepared. Even perhaps if you have uh, any money lying around, perhaps it would be a good idea to maybe convert it into gold or silver just for maybe the next six months and see what happens after September. I mean, it certainly can't hurt anyway. Again, this may not even happen in September. There may be a way that the United States can prolong this facade a little bit longer, but I don't think they'll be able to do it for too long because... The banking people that I'm talking to, and these are people who are very high up in the banking echelons, folks, that I've just kind of met recently. They're not like close friends or anything, but they're just people that I talk to. And when I say up at the high echelons, I'm not talking about like Rothschilds and central banks and stuff like this, just people who own chains of like the National Bank or the Commonwealth Bank and things like this. And they might own a few different banks and have regional managers in there holding the pot for them. But they're quite high up as far as the lower levels of banking goes. And when I say the lower levels, I'm talking about normal, everyday suburban banks and people that own chains of these things. Not reserve banks, not global conglomerates, but just large banking chains within their respective countries. But apparently all of the banking community at the highest levels are talking about what China may do on September the 10th And they're all talking about how the crash is going to happen and when it's going to happen. They're all wondering how and when. They're not wondering if it's going to happen. They are all completely expecting it to happen. They can't see any way out of it happening. They're just wondering how and when it's going to happen. And they're all very, very interested in the date of September the 10th, 2015. So I just thought it would be a good thing to share that with everybody. Again, folks, not to be fear-mongering, just to help people perhaps be a little bit prepared for what may be coming down the pike. And also to suggest that people pay attention and open lines of communication within their community that are not digital and do not depend on a digital network. I think it's a good idea. If you've got any old analog phones, I think it's a good idea to keep using these things if the network's still there and you can use them. But landlines, not wireless networks at all. Walkie-talkies, ham radio sets are always a good one. It's good to have a ham radio set on hand hooked up to a battery so that you've got that for when the world goes stone age. I mean, you just never know. It's good to have these things. I mean, even the Pony Express folks, just open lines of communication with people so that you do have a plan. So yeah, that's really the scenario at the moment, folks, and I just have to look at all of this stuff, and like I said, I'm, I'm not one to fearmonger, I'm not one to put out dire warnings, any of the regular listeners of my show know this, and so I don't put this information out there lightly. I think we are seeing some pretty significant things taking place, folks, and I think that there is a plan in all of this. The question is, what can we do to combat it? You know, I've been saying for years that our governments are in abusive office and if we rise as a community, we can hold them accountable. We can call them for abusive office. We can 
realize that what they're doing is actually a threat to national security because we are the nation and we can dismiss our governments, but we need a united community to do it. And if we're not prepared to stand up and do this, then things may go pear-shaped very quickly. You know, if it gets to the point where the financial system does come crashing down and everybody wakes up and suddenly their dollars are worth nothing, it's going to create a pretty uncomfortable situation and you're going to see a revolutionary situation unfold in the United States and in many Western countries. And folks, for all of you out there who say you want to have an armed uprising against your government, I can tell you right now that you don't. You don't want to be in a country that's having a revolution, folks. You don't want to do it. Um, Have a look at Yemen. Look what just happened to the revolution the people tried to have in Yemen, and that's what it was. It was a people's revolution. Don't let the news fool you when they're saying this was a an Iranian proxy war. It wasn't. It was a U.S. proxy war because Yemen is a puppet government and it was controlled by Western interests. And when the people tried to free themselves from that puppet government, you had all of some of the most brutal dictatorships in the world all go in there to maintain order, apparently. This is what we heard. You had Saudi Arabia going in there to stop the rebels taking over the government. And what they've done is they've reduced most of Yemen to rubble destroyed most of the infrastructure. There's no concern for civilian casualties or concern for hospitals or schools or markets or anything like this. They just blew the whole place up and turned it to rubble in order to protect the government. And they took a whole bunch of other brutal dictatorships in there to help them. You look at the alliance that was used to go in and attack Yemen. And these are brutal dictatorships. And even the United States supplying Egypt with tanks and weapons. Egypt is a military dictatorship. So this was a U.S. proxy war. And they've done it to destabilize the area and to, I'd say, probably put a U.S. base in there. But also, I think they've done it to have a practice run, see how the soldiers and special forces perform in war zones, take over the Walmarts and just run it and see how it all turns out. And, folks, you've got to understand that in many ways we've pushed them to this because they are scared. You know, the amount of people that are waking up across the planet right now is exponential. It's absolutely amazing how many people are coming online and actually realising that they've been fed a lie. And so, yeah, they are running scared. They are absolutely terrified of what this global awakening will bring because when the truth sinks into people, when the truth of 9-11 sinks into people, the fact that elements within the United States themselves, elements within the military-industrial complex, elements within the government... They carried out the 9-11 attacks themselves. They killed 3,000 of their own people, and then they started waging wars against other countries and have killed millions of people in response, knowing all the while that these people were innocent. And there's been a lot of people involved in this, and there's been a lot of people involved in the cover-up. And that's why you've got a reasonable amount of people on the dark side, if you want to call it that, who are prepared to attack the people and are prepared to repress the people because it's the only hope they have of survival because if the people really rise up, you know, if 9-11, the truth of 9-11 sinks into the minds of people and they do rise up, they're going to be chasing these politicians down the street with pitchforks and ropes. I mean, honestly, it will. There'll be lynch mobs that want to get hold of these people once the truth sinks in. And so they are running scared. But the problem is that they've got the mechanism to be able to lock society down if they want to, if we don't wake up to the fact that it's all fiction and we can't create some sort of lines of communication with our police and our National Guard and our military and help these people understand that they've got to be on the side of the people and that we can circumvent this whole system, even the whole economic system, everything, we can circumvent the whole thing if we step into our power and stand up as a community and call things for what they are. We can still do it. We don't have to go through this crunch. We don't have to go through this crisis. We don't have to see any takeovers. We don't have to see any economic crashes. We don't have to see any wars. We don't need to see any revolutions or any coups. All we need is an empowered humanity to stand up and call things for what they are, and we can make a difference. And we've been given every opportunity to do it, folks. We really are. I've said this over and over again. We've been given every opportunity to do it, but time is running short. It really is. If we don't stand up and do this before the situation develops into something confrontational, 
then it will simply lapse into chaos and it will be every man for himself and we'll have to see where we go from there because from that point anything goes and anything's possible. And even fighting against our governments will be extremely difficult, folks, because they have technology that many people are not aware of. Look at 9-11. How did those buildings come down? There's all sorts of stuff going on that we don't know about. Now, the thing is that we don't have to fight against our governments, folks, because we've got all the tools we need to be able to deal with things now if we choose to stand up and be counted. And there are enough people in the world who are awake for us to do this, folks. There are enough of us. If everybody who is awake chooses to step into their power and stand up and have their voice heard, then we can make a difference because we can wake up the rest of the community because most of the community is starting to wake up. Most of the community are looking at things going, this is just all wrong. How did the world get to be in this state? And people are starting to ask questions, and what they need now is for people to be able to point them in the right direction, and the right direction is personal empowerment. That is the right direction. You know, if we stand up as one empowered, united community, then the system has nowhere to go. I mean, even in Thailand recently, we saw the soldiers and the police putting their weapons down and siding with the people, and that's what we'll see in many cases in our countries too. The only ones who won't do it will be the psychopaths, and they are vastly outnumbered folks. And if we show some solidarity and some compassion and we approach this situation with a calm demeanor, channel our anger into calm, logical response, I believe we will make a difference and we will inspire the entire world to stand up and join with us. I really think we have a way out of this, folks, if we choose to step into our power And now is the time that we need to do it. And the timing cannot be more important. We really do need to stand up and be counted, folks. And so I'm just about out of time here, folks. I will be in the UK in May speaking at AV6 with Ian Crane and Ken O'Keefe and a whole bunch of other people. Zen Gardner will be there. So do make it along to that if you're in England. It'd be great to see you. I then have to have a meeting with the core group involved in Full Circle Project so we can hopefully launch that very quickly afterwards. And I may be doing a radio show next week or I may be off air next week. I'm not sure. But if I do a show next week, it will be the last show that I do until at least mid to late June because that'll be when I get back from overseas. But look, that is it for me. I've run out of time again. It's always a pleasure to come and talk to you, though, folks. Thank you for listening to the show today. Thank you to anybody who's ever made a contribution to my website, thecrowhouse.com. It really is needed, folks, if anybody can. And my deep gratitude goes out to anybody who ever has. That is it for me, folks. I'm completely out of time. I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take good care until then. In Lakesh, my friends. In Lakesh.